In the seventh part of the Vintage Motherboard Hall series, we have the ASUS K8N. If you like bulge, then stay tuned. Hello everyone and welcome to the seventh part in the Vintage Motherboard Hall series. I know that from that intro I'm already demonetized, so we might as well start swearing. No, no we're not. <laughs> That's not what we're gonna do. What we have here is the ASUS K8N, which is an ATX form factor board, circuit 754 from AMD. This board is circa 2004, so it's closing in on 20 years old. And uh, yeah, as you can see, we got a lot of uh, bulgy boys. We got, uh, let's count them, one up there, one there, one there, that's three, four, five, six, seven. These are also bulging, eight, nine, ten, eleven of them are bulging. I don't have very high hopes of this board actually posting, but, you know, this is actually the exact opposite of the board in the previous part. Here, with the power delivery caps are are looking fine, but everything else is bulging like hell, so who knows what we're gonna end up with. So, in terms of overall layout, we have an ATX one factor board, like we said, we have three DDR1 RAM slots, they can hold one gigabyte each, this is a single channel architecture, so we have uh, an odd number of ports. We have two IDE channels over here. We have a 20-pin ATX connector, so the transition to 24-pin was not made uh, until socket 939. Uh, again, the uh, supplemental power is next to the CPU cooler. The two SATA ports are located here in the middle of the board, which is the worst ever location I've seen them. But this was the first implementation of SATA, more or less. Uh, yeah, so there's SATA 1, 150 megabytes per second, and 1.5 gigabytes, or gigabits per second, rather. The K8N means that it is a K8 platform, which means Athlon 64 and the like. The N stands for an Enforce chipset. We have the Enforce 3 chipset on here. This is an Enforce 3 chipset with AGP. It's the lower end version of that. So we have floppy here on this side. We have a clock battery, which is likely dead. This was in this more or less scrap pile of the motherboard hole because there are a couple of boards that are visibly uh, have visible problems like bulging caps or even a hole in the board uh, burn marks stuff like that so that's what we're ending up with in this series the last couple of videos are boards that have visible potential problems right so on the bottom here we have the nice color coded area for the front panel headers that's something that asus did really well back in the day that's why I really appreciate ASUS boards, and I have a couple of them from this era. Uh, it's definitely a very nice feature to have. We have two USB headers down here as well. We have some soldering pads for an onboard RAID controller. We would have gone here and had four SATA ports there. That is a header for probably a COM port or parallel port. Nope, it's actually a game port header. I should read. Onboard audio is real tech. We're well in the uh, AC97 uh, range of boards now. So yeah, some front panel headers there for CD audio as well, just for legacy purposes. This is socket 754, like I said. Under here is an Athlon 64 3200+, which is a decent spec CPU for this platform. This board is shaped like a banana, which is good. Also got some free standoffs with it, which I've removed. We have PS2 ports. We have our digital audio headers here. The protection cap for the toss link is missing so i'm assuming either someone took it out or actually used this for digital audio we have serial parallel four usb 2.0 ports ethernet and uh, multi-channel audio i am not able to detect whether or not this will be a gigabit controller at this point in time i believe gigabit controllers were starting to become the norm from enforce 4 onwards but enforce 3 is probably still 100 megabit which is fine it's, it's uh, yeah, not a problem at all. Okay, that concludes the outside tour of the motherboard. Let's put in some components and see if it even turns on at all. All right, so let's get started. Here we have a video card, GeForce 4 MX 460. It's a known good card. Yes, and I'm not using my Riva TNT 2. But, you know, this is probably fine. All right, so now it doesn't matter where we put the RAM because we only have a single memory channel, which means a memory 
bus width of 64 bits. Oh, come on, Mr. Banana. There you go. In fact, let's just stick to 256. Should be good enough for now. Uh, yep, let's connect power. Hopefully this time we won't forget to actually plug in a keyboard, mouse, and monitor. That's just the way my brain works sometimes. People who know me in person will be able to definitely confirm that. Where is this cam plug? There we go. CPU power. The board is powering up because we have a green LED, so that's good. That's all the basics we need. I'm not going to connect IDE and SATA this time. We will, however, use the VGA because this video card has dual VGA only. Monitor powers up. And that should be all we need. No, I'm not connecting Ethernet and audio this time. Because this will be interesting to see if it even posts. So, let's go and see if that's the case. Alright, so let's go and hit that power switch. Yep, the video card is working. Wow, that's looking decent. Okay, it already completed its post. It's quicker than I thought it would. Okay, so we have CMOS settings wrong. Big surprise there. CMOS date and time not set. Press F1 to run setup, which we will do. It is now 2002. Instant music option. Ah, yes, I remember something like that. If you connect this to a speaker, you can make it talk to you. Very interesting. No AI overclock tuner. I don't think we need to overclock. It's only a 3200 plus, so there's not much to be gained. Cool and quiet. We can enable that because I didn't bother to do a repaste. So I'm going to guess the CPU is going to be going into overdrive. Our primary video is AGP. Fast writes, I'm not sure if this video card supports it, so we're going to leave it at automatic. USB config, we want USB 2.0, so we want high speed instead of full speed. Full speed is USB 1, in case you don't know. Right, so... Onboard MIDI port. It's not like there's much to MIDI, but eh, we'll just set it to 330 and RQ5. We have plug and play OS, yep, we're not going to be running MS-DOS on here. Advanced power management, I don't really care that much about that. Our CPU is running 25 degrees, so it should be holding. We can have some Q fan here so we can make it ramp up and down. Don't really see the need to do that right now. We only have the boot device set to floppy because there's nothing else. Uh, this AMI BIOS is such an upgrade from, uh, from the older rewards. It's nice to see. Okay. Let's see if this board can do what the other one couldn't, and that's post after setting the BIOS settings and turning it off again. The splash screen is also very neat. I like it. Post is very quick too on this board. Extremely quick. Yep, reboot and select proper boot device because there's nothing to boot from. Cool. Let's hook up a drive and a CD-ROM drive and see if it will power up again after we turn it off. We're gonna do that on video, of course. So here we have our board again. Power switch is right here. There we go. did a reset. I want it to turn off, thank you. Okay, enjoy my shadow passing by as we go ahead and connect the IDE. Uh, pins are bent on it. It's a big surprise. Let's do it this way then. 
angle it on there and then it'll straighten itself out again. Right, so we also need a SATA connection for our hard drive. Put it on the board like so. This board, or this uh, disc rather, should work fine for this. Regular 80 gig Hitachi drive. With nothing on it, I think. And if it has something on it, we're about to find out. Yep, this board still powers up. I saw all of the boot devices pass by. There's nothing to boot from on the CD-ROM side. Discrete error occurred. Yep, this disc is wiped. Alrighty then. In that case, we'll take out our DOS benchmarking CD. We'll put in a CD-ROM for Microsoft Windows XP and see if it will boot from that. I'm already impressed that this thing boots at all, considering uh, it is uh, the bulge. So it should start booting from CD-ROM straight away, I think. Otherwise the boot priority is not set properly, which would be my bad. Everything in this video is my bad anyway. And, uh, yeah. Yep, Windows setup starts to load. Okay. I'm going to see how far I can get into Windows setup. The other board didn't get very far, as we saw. And, uh... We'll report back once there is something else to tell you. Well, what a result. Windows is... Oh, no, it's not. <laughs> right, so... I was installing Windows XP. And, uh, yeah, when it started to uh, do the setup devices phase, this error popped up. The, uh... Yeah. So I guess this board isn't stable either. Oh, well... Would have been so nice, wouldn't it? Let's see where the reset button is, it's over there. I don't have very high hopes of this board working properly then either. So I guess this will also go on the recap pile. Oh well. At least it still posts after being reset. That's an upgrade over the previous uh, board, so yeah. But it's still not stable enough to actually make it through a Windows setup. Which is a shame. So yeah. I guess that uh, concludes this part as well. This board isn't stable either and needs to be either recapped or further investigated. That's outside of the scope of the Vintage Motherboard whole series where we just initially test the boards. And if you can get into an operating system, do some basic, uh, get some perform basic performance numbers. Some of these boards will get follow-up videos with some troubleshooting and uh, performance testing so we can do some comparisons left and right. But that's outside of the scope again of this video series. So, I hope you enjoyed this uh, video. I thank you all for watching and I'll see you guys in the next part.